that sort of conundrum was churning somewhere in my subconscious and then you know bubbled up this necklace idea that really and i think the reason we were able to do that is because it was centered around my own experience so it wasn't like we're just this fun brand but we want to talk about mental illness it was like i really wanted to talk about it and i wanted to be able to have those conversations through bando so that i didn't have to have them somewhere else and like it just popped the bubble for us dear family is a podcast hosted by rachel steinman a writer an educator and a mental health advocate And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hi, dear family and friends. Get ready for another inspirational and eye-opening story. Thank you so much for listening. And if you aren't already doing so, please subscribe and share, dear family. It means the world to me and makes all the difference. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited because today I have Jen Gotch. She truly was at the top of my dream list for guests, and I'm so thrilled she agreed to be here with us today because she is the co-founder and the chief creative officer of the multi-million dollar business Bando. The brand's goal is to make you feel better with their bright, optimistic products. And her 250,000 Instagram followers and her Jen Gotch's OK Sometimes podcast listeners, they just love her mental health advocacy as she bears her heart with a lot of spunk, humor, and personality. She's just written her first book, and it's a memoir called The Upside of Being Down. It's about how her mental health struggles led to her greatest successes in work and in life. And although she was raised by loving and attentive parents in Boca Raton, Florida, her early signs of bipolar disorder, anxiety, and ADD went unrecognized. After graduating college, she was living back with her parents, heartbroken and lost when she became convinced that her skin turned green. Hallucinating she looked like Shrek was terrifying, but it led to her first diagnosis. And it was the start of a journey towards self-awareness, acceptance, success, and ultimately joy. While simultaneously dealing with her mental health struggles, she worked as a TV extra, a prop stylist, an art director, a commercial photographer, and eventually, an accidental and beloved entrepreneur. Jen now embraces her flaws, appreciating the influence mental illness has on her creativity that continues to lead to her greatest successes in business and in life. Bando, with its first UK office, with hubs already in Kentucky, Hong Kong, and Los Angeles, has been written up in Forbes, Fast Company, and more. Jen's brand personality is to not feel competitive with other people, but to actually support them and to just be real. Case in point, she designed and sold the very popular anxiety and the depression necklaces to legions of grateful women with the net proceeds going to the mental health nonprofit Bring Change to Mind. So come along and have some fun because Jen sure is. And don't be surprised if you leave feeling inspired to be more colorful, and dance in front of dumpsters. Hi, Jen. Hi. So we are recording at the Bando Penthouse, and it's your company's creative headquarters. And it's so cool here. It's so, as you imagine, bright (laughs) and festive and pink and happy and open, and I love it. Some people say it's a lot quieter. The office itself is a lot quieter than they thought it would be. And I'm just like, well... People do have to work. Like if you come at lunch, it can get quite rowdy. But I feel like people's first thing is like, oh, it's so pretty. Oh, it's so quiet. Right, right. Like, oh, maybe I'll go take a nap here, but yeah. not for long. Yeah. We're just meeting for the first yeah. time, but I kind of feel like we're kindred spirits, maybe because we were born the same exact year <laughs> and we became teenagers during the 80s yeah. with big hair and all. <laughs> Whereas I was a Valley girl, truly growing up in the Valley. You grew up in Boca Raton. Yeah. I just have to imagine yeah. similar, yeah, yeah. you know, kind of the same 
Jewish parents. Yeah. You know, <laughs> my mom was also very kind of spiritual, and my dad was an attorney. I know your dad was yeah. a doctor. We also had a younger brother. I just, I don't know. There's like, know. So, there's some of that, that kind list. of like, <laughs> yeah. Whereas you were with an Andrew for many years. My longest relationship before my husband was also an Andrew. So I don't know. <laughs> just as I read your book, I just kept, you were oh like, my God, that too, that too. <laughs> so I'd love to hear a little bit about Boca Raton and mm. your family and what it was like growing, growing up. up. Well, I'll say, especially out in California, I feel like Florida tends to get kind of a bad rap. And it is a very interesting state. There's a lot that goes on. <laughs> I don't think of it well, negatively. It, it's like when I first moved out here and I'd be like, I'm from Florida. And they're like, ugh, Florida? And I'm like, wait, Florida's Why? great. Yeah. So I have a huge love for Florida, still do. I grew up in Boca Raton, which then was quite a small town. Like it's much larger now, but it was like, I feel like it was simple. I mean, I spent a lot of time outside barefoot walking for miles, <laughs> like things that are just like, <laughs> the kids don't do now. Doing? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I was never in the house. I maybe watched a little bit of TV, but a ton of sunshine, which I think is a huge contributor to happiness. I loved it. And honestly, I think I might've written about this, but the move from South Florida to Southern California was probably one of the least shocking that you could have because there's like, overlap in the beautiful weather and the sunshine Similar and culture, so, like had I moved to Portland or something I probably would have yeah. been in shock although it does rain in South Florida and when I was out here maybe three months in I was like something's weird about it here and it <laughs> rained and I was like oh my god it doesn't rain where Florida is like so tropical so it's almost guaranteed most days that you're gonna get a little shower so yeah it was great though I mean I still go home a lot and consider it home and your parents were from New York and they moved to Boca Raton, which is really kind of like a retirement, in my mind, maybe yeah. I'm not like a retirement yeah. community. But. I, there's certainly in the surrounding cities, there are definitely more retirement communities, but some of that was by design because, I mean, this was over 40 years ago. But at that point, my dad was just getting his podiatry practice off the ground and podiatrists thrive with older feet. There you go. <laughs> Young feet don't <laughs> tend to need as much podiatry as older feet. And, so. and by the way, everyone needs to follow your Instagram stories <laughs> just so they can see your dad. Cause he, like when he wore the outfit that was like a cover up, it was yeah. a very colorful yeah, yeah, cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I want to do that with my dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to have a really amiable dad, but he, yeah, uh, your dad he, he does aim, aim to please. Yeah. yeah. He seems really Dr. Dr. Jamie, Dr. Jamie, Dr. Okay. Jamie 14 is all Instagram right, handle. we'll put his link in the yeah, show notes. Yeah, please do, All right, because absolutely. he calls me very often with his numbers, with and his he doesn't updates. understand when people just randomly <laughs> unfollow him. I'm like, that's just how Instagram works. It's an he's ebb and in, flow. He's, oh, how funny. But, he's actually you know, watching. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. it. Jen, you say that you are ADHD, but you weren't mm. diagnosed until 29. Mm -mm. So that's a long time to go through life without getting a diagnosis. Yeah. Why do you think? I mean, listen, I think a lot of people go through their whole life without that diagnosis. I think for me, I'm a relatively smart person. So I was able to do most things just in a way that was really difficult. But so much of any mental health issue really is experienced inside yourself. And so it wasn't like there were all of these red flags to be like, hmm, should we get her tested for that? When I look back, I can see it, but there just wasn't that level of awareness across the board, like not just with my parents, but in the world. I mean, no teacher ever called that out. I got yeah. through college yeah. and it wasn't until I really started to dig in with therapy and psychiatry that you kind of take all these tests. And I think I was probably explaining my symptoms to a doctor then, things that I could articulate that I wouldn't have been able to articulate when you were young, when I was yeah. young. And so did you simple. ever feel the need to self-medicate? No, until I was told about it, I didn't realize that I was compromised. You know what I mean? Like, it's like you're just used to your brain acting a certain way. No, I mean, I definitely was medicated once I was on it, which I didn't like either. In your book, 
you say that Adderall was like having sex with Sam Rockwell. <laughs> <laughs> that will be too long to explain. Okay. But, <laughs> but in a nutshell, it's great and awful. And it actually has very little to do with Sam Rockwell and more to do with Sam Rockwell's character in Charlie's Angels. He was a sweet guy and a villain at the same time. Okay. So my relationship to Adderall was very similar to that in, you know, it was like something that made me feel so good, but also felt kind of dangerous and made me feel bad. I got a lot done when I was on it, but. Well, you explained that perfectly. Yeah. So oh, and then people will have to read your book to learn more. About and that. watch Charlie's Angels. And watch Charlie's Angels. Which is a great Angels. movie. Angels. Exactly. <laughs> when were you diagnosed with depression? Mm. When I was 23, again, the incident that you describe in the intro was sort of a catalyst for taking me to a doctor and actually seeing what's going on. So it wasn't that that was the onset. It was just that's when it sort of presented in such a way that it was kind of undeniable that something was going on. I think it was probably clear as day to a doctor. <laughs> Right, but it's interesting because, like, to me, that seems like a manic episode, right? I think it was an outbreak. And maybe in retrospect, sure, but it was sort of the coming to a head of all of this internal sort of, I mean, depression and how that makes you feel and how confusing it is. And like my brain feeling so compromised and just not knowing that it was years of that packed in. So I think it was more like just like an outburst that would when you have that much pressure inside of you. Right. And you, you know? had moved home from college and mm -hmm. you were heartbroken and your mom finally like said, we need to take you to a therapist. Yeah. And you felt probably a little relieved mm. to get a diagnosis. I or, did. I, yeah. I, and I don't know that that is necessarily a common thing, but I mean, I found it very helpful to have a name to put to how I was feeling. Right. And I mean, selfishly also thought I could get more attention, oh. <laughs> which is <laughs> not healthy, but we've worked through that. But yeah, I mean, I think any diagnosis I've ever received, I've always seen as a positive. I mean, it's there. So it's not like naming it presents something that wasn't there. So to me, it feels just like an aid because you have a point of reference, Yeah, you know, but in retrospect, because we're talking in retrospect, it was really a misdiagnosis because you were given Prozac. Do you want to explain what happens if you're on Prozac for a long period of time and you're not really? Sure. Well, yeah. I was depressed. Yeah. I just was suffering with bipolar 2, which right. looks a lot like depression. Okay. Because the mood swings that you have are much more focused, lie in the depressive episodes. And the Manic episodes aren't really manic. They're like hypomanic. So it's much harder to notice. So I was given Prozac. But unfortunately, if you have bipolar and you only have an antidepressant, it can oftentimes complicate the bipolar and eventually stop working and wreak havoc. And so it didn't do that for quite some time. It was really very, very incredibly helpful for me for many years. And it wasn't until, you know, I mean, sort of you get in your 20s and there's just a lot of situational contributors to right. your mood. And so I think, you know, it was like a very slow building snowball effect of like, what's happening in my life? What's happening in my brain and my body? And so then eventually it did wreak havoc. It's hard to believe that you had to overcome shyness because when you <laughs> watch your shy. story, no, no. How did you do that? Yeah. You know, I don't know that it was something that I set out to do. I was just like an incredibly shy kid, like the kind of kid that would like cry if you talk to them. I remember getting my driver's license, but still being afraid to go through the drive through because I didn't want to, it was like too embarrassing you have to, to talk. Even talk. Yeah. <laughs> so I would always have a friend go with me. But yeah, I think, I don't know what all the contributors were to my shyness, but I certainly operated with a lot of self-doubt and was incredibly self-conscious and going away to school helped me sort of reset. Find your voice. And yeah, well, and just find myself, you know, there's very few people knew me. <laughs> So it's like you really do. And I feel like a lot of kids experience this. Like you can kind of reinvent yeah. yourself if you want. I'm not a big planner. So I don't think I was like, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to do this. 
but I feel like it just opened something for me and then just sort of gradually happened. And really like the overtly unshy me that is now really even is like the last maybe 10, 15 years, because I think, and I'm sure you can relate to this too. Like when you get to a certain age, it's just like, you just start questioning stuff like that. Like, what do I really have to lose here? And then I think being in a leadership role, you can't really be shy. I mean, people are looking to you to guide them. So that's one of the benefits of aging. There aren't many. (laughs) Yeah, I think there's a lot. I mean, I think if you take out everything physical, yeah, you're fine. I totally agree. You know, I I mean, it's a huge gift. Like most people wouldn't want to go back to their Mm -mm. teens or even their 20s. Mm -mm. I know. You hosted your own podcast Mm -hmm. called Jen Gotch is OK Sometimes, which I loved. (laughs) I also love how open your parents are, Mm. um, especially about the conception story on Valentine's Day. Yes. And (laughs) it's clear where you get your sense of humor from. (laughs) Do you think you'll ever resurrect your podcast? I would love to. I didn't want to give it up. It became a necessity because I was still working here at Bando. I was starting to write the book and doing the weekly podcast, a podcast which I had created just like the most complex. There were no interviews outside of my parents, like, and maybe one or two other people, but it was such that I was doing days of research. And then recording it. And so it was clearly the thing I was most passionate about because I had cleared so much time. But then it became very evident that some of my other responsibilities were being neglected. But I had always assumed that once the book was written, I would just bring it right back. But then I didn't anticipate what happens after a book is written (laughs) and the work that goes into that. So I definitely I'm tossing around ideas. There will be something I, I, at some I point. I can't wait for it to come Good. back. But I think that your voice as a mental health advocate was so inspirational to so many people. Good. And I've told a bunch of people I'm coming to interview you. Oh. And they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> I know that you're a real girl's girl. Mm-hmm. Speaking of finding, like, you know, recreating who you were and being shy before, you became the president of your sorority. <laughs> And you can just tell that, you know, you're a fun friend to be around. And I know that you're good friends with Kelly Oxford, who's really fun to follow on Mm, Instagram. And also you presented with Busy Phillips for the Glamour Women of the Year Summit. Can you just tell us about why female friendships are so important to you? Yeah. The thing I did with Busy was about like us in conversation about becoming friends as grownups. So female adult friendships, which I think I may have sort of taken for granted. I didn't understand that that's something that people would be curious about, but I've noticed that I get asked about it a lot. And I actually think that that was something I struggled with more in my mid 20s, early 30s, because you're not in school anymore. I didn't have a stable job. I'm living in L.A., you know, and I remember talking to my therapist about it and being like, how do you make friends? And she was like, well, you take a class, you join some sort of a group, you exercise at a gym, maybe someday you get a job. (laughs) And so I think like the how to do it came much earlier for me. I think many times I'm a great friend. I'm not the most consistent friend just based on who I am as a person and having a mood disorder and having sort of a relatively busy life. So I really only have a few very close friends. I feel like I have a lot of friends, but I think I have very specific boundaries around my friendships because I don't want to let people down. But I think it's like when you're younger, a lot of your friends are, I don't want to say friends of convenience, but it's like who sat next to you in math class. And There was just less depth to who we are as people. As you get older, at least for me, because I'm such a self-aware person, I can see someone and be like, I bet we would be friends based on A, B, and C. Like, not just like, I want to be that person's friend, but I actually think I can see myself in things that they're saying or doing. And I'm a very intimacy built through conversation. I can kind of click in with someone right away. And then that's usually a good indicator that that's And I read the article and it said something about how like you knew right away with Busy Phillips. 
did you give her your earrings or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> like you just immediately had that connection and connected with her. And yeah, the idea to have a friend, you have to be a friend. I mean, I tell my daughters that all the time. Yeah, it's like you true. can't just expect your friends to just do things for you or yeah. call you. You have to make the effort. Even if you are busy and running a yeah. company. And you just communicate that. You, communicate. you just communicate yeah. that. And I do think, especially as grownups, showing up for your friends in a meaningful way is probably one of the most impactful things you can do in a friendship. I didn't understand that, actually. And I think like because I'm pleasant and funny <laughs> and usually in a good mood when I put myself in front of people, that I almost got away with it. And I think like once I got divorced and I was really able to commit some time to myself and looking at the friendships I had, I sort of reset my intention to be like, I am going to show up for people and I'm going to communicate when I can't. And I'm also going to get better about saying no, if I already know I'm not going to be able to do something, which is like one of the hardest things, but it's like a great way to let somebody down. <laughs> So, but I mean, I love that we're having this conversation because I do think it is part of mental wellness. Is yeah. Understanding the importance of having really close friends that you can rely on that yes. can talk to you and tell you the truth yes. and that understand and give you kind of that room to be busy yes. and not expect too much of you when you can't give it. So yeah. It's a great, I'll, I'm going to also put that article in the show notes. In the past, you mentioned how you filled an emotional void with food. Mm. Do you think that you have body dysmorphia? Well, I think the two things are very separate. Okay. Like emotional eating, I think, has more to do with self-soothing. And right. I think so many of us as children are soothed yes. with food. And um, adults. Yeah. <laughs> then it's just something yeah, you, it you know, it's like, yeah. hey you know, feel good, let's get some ice cream. And then, yeah. you know, you find yourself right. in a bowl of ice cream as a 40 year old because you're heartbroken, which is not to say that like, that's an important, like self-soothing is an important thing. I think for me, it can get a little off the rails. And then that does spiral. There's like a shame spiral that has to do with that. The body stuff is very separate for me. And I absolutely have body dysmorphia. It's like low on my list of things that I engage with. So much of that is tied to self-worth. I'm really focused, especially this year, because I feel like I've been able to trek through a lot of the other issues that were standing in my way, like connecting to my own self-worth. I really feel like a lot of those little like peripheral things like that will dissolve. So it's not something that I'm consumed with, but I know for a lot of people like when you have something like body dysmorphia at a very extreme rate, it can be incredibly paralyzing. So I don't have it to that degree, but I'm certainly probably think I am look different than I actually think I look. Well, <laughs> but we, I mean, we'll I, never know. I don't, and I, you know, I know maybe you're not supposed to comment on somebody's looks. Well, you're not supposed stuff, to. We're, I mean, we're both but, in our but, late 40s, like, so we can do what I, I we want. I think you're beautiful. But, you know, also you were in this world of stylist, you're in LA. When you're younger, yeah. there's that pressure. I can't speak for you, but I can say for me, as I get older, I'm just like grateful for a healthy body. Yes. You same. know, and my self-worth is coming from my accomplishments and of my course. relationships. And, of course. And I'm, it sounds like you're... Yeah. I mean, getting to a place where you actually feel good inside and can like rely on that, it really does. It just changes your perspective on anything else. Like I've definitely committed a lot of time and energy to my well-being over the last several years because I had hit like a very low low and feeling good, like to me trumps anything. It's not like when I am feeling my best, I'm not even really looking at my body. I'm just like, it doesn't even matter because I feel so good. I don't need to adjust. So that's, so that's great. Yeah. That's, that's enlightened. That's it's a good, good feeling. That's moving yeah. forward. Yeah. Well, what, because you mentioned that you've had food therapy. Mm. I don't even know I what that is. <laughs> well, I went to a food therapist. I was talking to my friend who's been highlighting my hair for like, I don't know, 15 years or something. And so we always talk about, you know, whatever. I mean, the things we talk about with right. the people that they are, do our hair. They're kind of like therapists, <laughs> right? They're our hostage yeah. and we're theirs. 
we were talking about something with food and she was like, I went to a food therapist recently. And I was like, a food therapist? I mean, obviously being very well versed in traditional therapy, I was like, is it what I think it is? And she was like, yeah, it's essentially like a therapist who is focused on like your relationship to food and food and health and mind body stuff. And so I was like, really more out of curiosity, because I think I'm just on a constant hunt for like, could something be better? Could I get better at something? So I went to see her just once. But yeah, she just gave me just some very valuable insight. In fact, I came back to the office the next day. And I was like, everyone gather around. (laughs) I'm going to save you $300 and tell you what my food therapist told me. But she just talked a lot about emotions and how they relate to food. Like we got a little bit into nutrition, but I felt like I kind of know all that stuff. I was more focused around the emotional eating part. And mindfulness is such a popular thing now. Thank goodness. Like it's such a very powerful thing that you can employ. So essentially she was teaching me mindful eating, which she didn't call it that. But anytime you can break even for 10 seconds to like really focus on what you're doing, it changes the whole act. To just kind of step back yeah. and look at it and think about it. Why am I doing you, this? Yeah, I'm just be like, yeah, why, that's why really am I doing helpful. this? And sometimes it's like, because this is absolutely the thing I right. need and then you keep right. doing it. Or right. if it's like, well, actually something else is really right. bothering me and I'm just doing this instead. Yeah. You know, she was always like, maybe just take a break and yeah. write down what that is. And yeah. then when you're done, if you feel like you got to go back to the yeah. eating, go back to the eating. Yeah. It's you also know? maybe a little bit too, like kind of taking a second to listen to your intuition and not just like being blindly just like yeah pulled by something certainly it takes um, a lot okay, of training so i am <laughs> going to totally switch gears okay. and i would love you to tell us about bando mm. how far back do you want to go oh whatever you <laughs> however far you want to tell us well my friend and i started it gosh, almost 12 years ago. And we really just set out to have a side project where we were making these one of a kind hair accessories and selling them. It sort of became a company that had a very strong brand sensibility very early on. But because we were not business people or marketing people or had studied any of that, I don't think we were truly aware of the groundwork that we were laying as we were just like inadvertently working away, just trying to like sell things. And I think like really at the onset, we both arrived with connecting with people. Like we were both like very much loved to make people laugh and like enjoyed conversations. And I think being able to make something and then offer it to someone else, even though they're giving you money, in return, like it just still feels like a connection. And I think some of those things have been the through line to the bando of today. So essentially what happened is about four years in, Jamie, my co-founder, needed to move out of state. And so there was no way. We were still a very small business at the time, but there was really no way that I was going to be. I am not one you would employ to run a business ever. <laughs> so we were like, we didn't want to just shut our doors. Like We felt like we had something, but we weren't like a value. It wasn't like we were getting a $10 million valuation or something. I think we were probably valued at $150,000. But, you know, we thought if we try and sell it and someone buys it, like we can keep it alive. And that's what we did. We were lucky to sell to like an amazing couple, a great company. It's called Lifeguard Press. It's our parent company. And so in doing that, they were literally purely just looking for a brand voice and aesthetic. And that was primarily what we had. And they were able to add in things like production, distribution, sales, warehousing, just everything. So it was like really from that point on, I sort of went into like some version of business school while being allowed to remain extremely creative. And I mean, it's honestly a dream scenario. If there's anyone out there that's looking to like start a company and sell a company, this is not usually how it works, especially when you're a creative entrepreneur, because a lot of times that's part of what you give up is like the creativity that you were able to employ when there was less at stake doesn't always translate, but it just did. And not that I ever took it for granted, but having not had any other experience, I was like, this must be how it goes. But in speaking to so many other people that have been through a similar thing, it's not always like that. So that's really when the company started to pivot because 
we expanded the product line and we got this distribution that we didn't have. So then we're in stores, then we're in department stores, then we become more recognizable. All the while, social media is taking off and we're, you know, gaining a large Instagram following. And so now here we are, a much more established company and really wanting to feed into the same principles, a lot of what you said at the onset, like we're really about encouraging joy and truly just existing to help our community be their best, feel their best. And, you know, for a lot of time, we sort of marinated in the like fun brand space, which is a very valuable thing, especially when you're a wholesale company to be known as the fun brand or the serious brand or the cool brand, you know? And so we actively did not disrupt that, even though for me, I was like, well, we're very layered. Like I'm always like, you know, I personally tend to feel misunderstood. And I think I put a lot of that on the brand too. But over the last few years, we've really been able to evolve and like put out product lines that speak to holistic betterment, you know, and that's just like who we are now. And there's no intention to turn back. So it's like, joy is such a huge part of feeling good. So it's not like we had to turn our back on what we did, but actually like, how do we get into this space where we can improve people's lives, but do it in a way that fits our aesthetic and our voice and is like highly accessible where a lot of times, you know, the concept of wellness can feel very inaccessible. So I think right, it like, feel very heavy. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Or like yeah. there's something wrong. And like right. for right. us, obviously we, dipped our toes in the mental health space primarily because I wanted to, but there's so much in between, you know, having a mental illness and feeling great. And there's a lot in there that we want to explore, but it's not like, are you sick? Are you tired? Come to band out. It's like, Hey, like, let's just see how good we can feel. You know, you know, I think that's why people really connect to you is because, and I know this word's thrown around a lot, but you're authentic. And people can see that you can be dealing with things in your life and still have a full, happy life and have fun. Yeah. And, you know, the example I use, the case in point about your anxiety necklace Mm. that you created Mm -hmm. and the depression necklace, most people maybe like 10 years ago would have been like, what the hell are you wearing that for? I mean, they still still, They still might be. (laughs) But I think that that's what's so great is that your brand is a fun brand, but it's still able to do something like that where other people can feel like, wow, I can wear my emotions on my literal chest and still not be like Debbie Downer, you know? Yeah. And also, I just want to say, I love that all the proceeds went to bring Bring change change to mind because what an amazing organization that is. I, I spoke at a summit that they had and I was like, literally do I just come work for bring change to mind? Like, I don't know how I would tell everyone at Bando yeah, that I've left yeah, to go work yeah. at this mental health nonprofit, but they really are just a so fantastic phenomenal. group of people doing really great things. So it was almost happenstance that we ended up with them again, because I'm not a planner. So things just sort of tend to like, when I'm onto something that I think is a great idea or important, things tend to just fall in line. But I thank my lucky stars that we were connected and have been able to do this and continue to do it. So it's thrilling for me because I feel like I get both, you know, like I think there was a time where I was like, I think I have to just leave and go pursue this like more serious advocacy thing or whatever, but it's like, I don't want to leave Bandeau. I think that sort of conundrum was churning somewhere in my subconscious and then, you know, bubbled up this necklace idea that really, and I think the reason we were able to do that is because it was centered around my own experience. So it wasn't like, we're just this fun brand, but we want to talk about mental illness. It was like, I really wanted to talk about it. And I wanted to be able to have those conversations through Bandeau so that I didn't have to have them somewhere else. And it just popped the bubble for us. It's just so exciting though, because you're able to continue to create and yet also inspire so many people through your mental health advocacy. And that leads me to talking about your 250,000 Instagram viewers and your soon book readers. <laughs> and we you know, hope. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, no, no. We and, hope. you know, I'm sure they're going to just love the sense of humor in your book that's similar <laughs> to your hey, sense of humor. A lot of jokes your... were cut, by the oh, way. Oh, were they? It was, I had an amazing editor because... 
in the book writing process, you know, it's obviously hard to let go of a single word. Yeah. By the end, I was it's like, take it. killing your babies. Yeah, just yeah. take it. I feel like maybe there's just the right amount of humor for the subject oh, matter yeah, no, that no, I'm no. dealing it, with. I, I mean, and that's what's so great about you and the book is that you can bring these very difficult subjects and make them humorous and relatable. And that is definitely your strong suit. What I also love is <laughs> when I'm watching your Instagram stories, one minute you're very serious and you're talking about something that's very deep. And then the next second you're posting pictures of cactuses <laughs> that look like dildos and you're laughing at yourself and you're not taking yourself seriously. And yeah. I think that that's what people appreciate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that going back to the age thing, like I just feel like I have it all in perspective in a way that like is just hard to do when you're younger. Yeah. We're we didn't grow up with the luxury and the curse of social media, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. And I think like, so you kind of saw one or the other, right? Like you didn't necessarily get to see the complexity of life and people. And I think still it's very hard for most people to share that, but like, that's truly me. Like I can feel that way. And it's not like such a drastic mood shift, but it's like, I can also be feeling that way and still see a cactus and want to take a picture of it because like that's my personality, right. you know, and that who we are and what our personality is certainly factors into how we approach. But I just think that the perspective you've gained from paying attention in life and accruing years of experience of being alive, like it just allows you, you can just step back and look at things and everything doesn't have to be one-sided and you don't have to be defined by like one. And also thing. to make fun of yourself and yeah. find some humor and pain. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what the best comedians do, yeah. right? Which it, they tend to be in a lot of pain. <laughs> well, but if you think about like behind humor is often yeah. pain. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I mean, and I think I've certain times in my life have used it as a coping mechanism. I think like now it's more like I really have committed to taking a more lighthearted approach to those things. And so, I mean, humor just has always been such a huge part of my life. So I think it's like less about diminishing it with a joke or like masking something, but more, I found that the more I cleared away a lot of the pain I had and sort of just found access to the joy, it's a default. I'm not even like, let's make light of this. It's like, that's my natural approach is Let's just look at it from this point of view. So I feel like that was another hard earned thing, but like something we all have access to. We're just not necessarily taught that. You say that you've been compartmentalizing depression mm. in order to have a professional life for 20 years. Mm. And you've said, quote, you're pretty fucking good at it, <laughs> which I, sounds like clearly you are. And it seems like you are. And that the art is knowing when to rest mm -hmm. and when to persevere. I love that you are encouraging emotions at your workplace, mm -hmm. whereas like, you know, it used to be like you would never cry yeah. at work and don't let anyone like see you having yes. a meltdown. But you take the other. Yeah. What can you explain why? Yeah. I mean, I also think that there are the majority of workplaces are still lit. Very corporate, very, have, yeah. a, have a have a aversion to that type of emotion, but I think it's you know having never worked in an office before, this was my first time in any sort of structured environment, and I mean life happens along the way. So you know over a decade of being sort of confined daily <laughs> to an office and like expecting that like things that will bring you to tears like aren't going to happen makes no sense. And for me, I've just never been one probably to a fault at times, but to bury that sort of thing. I mean, gone are the days where I'm, you know, walking around sobbing. And that's certainly not what I encourage. But the idea to just be like, that is not allowed, or it's frowned upon, or you should feel shame is just to me, what an unhealthy thing for your employees. Like, how would you then expect them to be great and present at work when you're not letting them feel their feelings. It's so counter to anything that I believe. There was never a plan. And it was another one of those things. Like, it's so interesting to me because I'm not like, okay, this should be the protocol in this part of life or in this part of work. Like, it's just what my gut 
tells me. And it's just interesting to see how many of those things people are like, so you do this a little bit differently. You know, what made you do that? I'm like, well, I didn't, there wasn't a decision to make. It wasn't like, should we allow this or not? It's just always been allowed. And but you've created a culture where your employees or people that are working at Bando feel comfortable being themselves, which yeah. translates into probably a much healthier yeah. culture. And listen, you know, I don't know that I can speak for everyone to say that they, I mean, I think some of that comfort lies within. The most I can do is set a stage and open some doors for people to be able to express themselves or feel the most comfortable they can. But I've also realized that I could bend over backwards and some people just won't get there. Right. But then it's like what we're saying, like imagine that in an environment where it's like actually discouraged. Like I want healthy right. people, whether they right. work here for three months or three years or beyond. Yeah. Like I would love to be like a marker in people's lives where they were like, well, I did have that one job where <laughs> I felt really cherished and welcome and accepted. And yeah. we're just a very like accepting group. Like it's just that sort of judgment is just not encouraged. Loyalty and yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And it has it like any business it's gone through phases and there have been times where it just did not feel great or safe here, but there's peaks and valleys to everything. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of your, I would say journey <laughs> with Bando, so much of it comes from your style mm. and your fashion. I am not somebody that looks down on Florida. I actually love yeah. Florida. Have you watched Marvelous Mrs. Maisel this season? I, I, no, they, I they do a big thing it. in I know. Florida. My parents are like, you so have good. to watch oh it. Oh my gosh, it's so good. So in my mind, you kind of encapture that bright Florida, California, sunny feel. Mm. Just the other day, I was looking at something about Lily Pulitzer. Mm. For those that don't know, she was a Florida bred yeah. designer who did very bright patterns and kind of designed something that was more loose when people when was this yeah. in the 60s maybe or 50s? I think it was the 60s I mean I yeah. think she started with like a lemonade stand right. or something yes, she did she did um, and I'm just wondering was she an influence to yeah you or who were or are your biggest influences I mean I think growing up my mom was probably my first and biggest influence for a long period of time I mean up until the point where you're like I hate you and I don't want to do anything that you're doing which thankfully was just a phase, but I feel like she has a lot of confidence around her unique personal style. So I think that was it. I mean, and then obviously in the eighties, I think Madonna influenced my personal style a lot. (laughs) Like I was never a fashion magazine person. I'm sure it was like peripherally influenced by everything that was going on with me in Florida, anywhere I live, like same in LA, but like when something starts to happen, that's like a system I want to buck. I'm a rule follower. So it's like, so how can I be both? But I think with that, especially when it comes to anything personal, like I tend to like to be doing something more singular than like what everyone else is doing. But I don't know why. I mean. Well, okay. So, and I meant to ask you this earlier because you just mentioned how your mom had an influence on you. And you mentioned in your book that growing up, you were always mad at your mom. Mm. And yet she was your safety net, like yeah, the person complex. you would call yeah. first. Do you want to tell us just a little bit about the diamond and pearl comment? Well, I, that I think is like maybe a, it's a long one. That's okay. a long okay. one. But, so, but I will talk, have to read the book for yeah, that part. Yeah, to get because it spans multiple it's chapters. Really, it's really interesting. <laughs> but here's what I, I'm very happy to like explain the dynamic between my mom and I, which is both of those things that you said, we're in many ways very much like oil and water. Like our personalities just don't totally gel, but she also like has always sort of been this beacon for me. I mean, she's my mom. So, and she was really a lovely mom. As you mentioned, I had two exceptional parents. So neither of them were actively trying to do anything that would not further me. in some way, shape or form. So there was this complexity because in a lot of her trying to help me feel better or give me feedback or just be honest with me, she would actually say things that I took very personally. So the diamond and pearl thing just has to do with like, what was a very passing comment for her meant to make me feel good was something that actually made me feel bad and defined a huge part of my life and how I saw myself. 
But in going back now and talking to her about all those things, it's like she just saw it differently. And we didn't have that kind of communication. It was more like we always sort of had a low lying frustration. It was a very contentious relationship. We were very quick to get in an argument. There wasn't yeah. that like quiet time where we were like, well, what do you mean by that? It was just like, you're always going to worst case scenario. All of that said, like my mom has always been my emotional touchstone and has always been very open with how she's feeling and what she's thinking and really set a stage for me to feel comfortable with that too. And certainly as I, in my twenties, she was like the constant that I could rely on because you just can't always rely on people. Nothing against people, you know, and my dad, whom I love very much at the time was not like just he didn't lead with emotion. Like he wasn't like a cold dad by any stretch, but he just didn't explore those depths the way that my mom did. So, yes, it remains a complex relationship. Yeah, You know, I think mothers and daughters, there is that complexity. I think my daughters think that I can sometimes be nitpicky about yeah. things about them. And yeah. in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I'm just trying to help them. Yeah. And I don't realize that I'm probably not potentially yeah. hurting their feelings. Yeah. I'm coming from a place of like, you need to be doing this. And like you with your mom's relationship, I have to hope that when they're older, they yeah. know that I'm always there for them. But yeah, yeah I think we're often our like the worst critics. And yeah. So we... The, I totally related to that, that part that of it. Part yeah, of your I book. think a lot of people, that conversation, mother daughter relationships have come up in so many conversations yeah. I've had, even just with friends yeah. that have read the book. And I think it is, I mean, I also think I'm not a mother, but I think with motherhood and like looking back, like you said, I mean, it's like the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. Like I can look back now yeah. and compare it to other people's stories that I don't yeah. know that like that was a woman doing her best. Yeah. And look, you said she was your biggest design influence. Yeah. And clearly yeah, she, yeah, yeah. you know. So your memoir is coming mm. out March 24th. That's right. And it's called The Upside of Being Down, mm -hmm. which I just such a great title. Thank such you. Such a great title. But can you just quickly give us yeah. a little idea of why it's called that? Yes. Sometime around the age of 19, I committed to optimism and have never looked back and even just given a lot of the conversation that we've had thus far it's like i think you ultimately have one choice like is this going to be a good thing or a bad thing like so much of that has to do with perspective and i attribute a lot of my success personally and professionally to being highly optimistic and so the upside of being down is like there mental health issues or being down in any way, shape or form, like there is an upside. Like, I'm just like, there's always an upside, probably to a point that can be very annoying for people. But I just wholeheartedly believe it. I think like you don't always see the upside, like you don't necessarily get that immediately. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't, but you will get it. You know, sometimes it takes 10 years and you're like, ah, oh, was actually a really good thing. And so I think like leading with that, going into something that was going to cover some difficult stuff and, you know, just felt like I wanted it to be clear that my perspective is of optimism and resilience. It's not about like, these are all the things that happened to me and can right. you even believe it? <laughs> but, like, but it's also like, even in your lowest moments, you know, there's some light is going to come in. Yeah. Right? I mean, so I'm a hopeful finding, person. Yeah, I'm a hopeful yeah. person. I feel very lucky. I mean, I think the resilience piece is there's just that one little bit of hope and fight in me, pretty much regardless. <laughs> so now that you are properly diagnosed mm. and medicated, what is your three day rule? The mental health journey is not a linear one. And so you go up, down, back, forth, even when you're feeling like completely balanced. And even on medication, there are times that you can have a fallout. I mean, especially getting older, there's now I'm like, what's perimenopause? What's going on with my hormones? What's my diet? What's actually bipolar? It's like the most complicated right. thing to navigate. And so for me, usually something that's like a minor incident can kind of flow in and flow out in a matter of two or three days. When it gets to three days, I really start to pay attention and I don't let anything get to a week because at that point, it's most likely not going to just turn itself around. Like something has to be looked at. And so I've just found that like having that 
trained support system in place, like therapist or psychiatrist or both for those times has been really important. And like the way that I can be responsible about managing my own mental health, because, you know, you'll get to places where you feel great and the medication's working and it's just, it's like a non-issue, but it just doesn't, I mean, it's just like, that would be too easy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, but I think that's a helpful reminder because, I mean, I have to talk to my mom about that too, that sometimes you're sad because you should be sad, totally. right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's human nature to have ups and downs, yeah. but if it's prolonged, then start talking to your doctor and yeah. therapist. And, I mean, I think- And I like the idea of a three-day rule. Like after three days, you start to look at yeah. it. And yeah. And you're very self-aware. Well, that's the thing. I yeah. mean, I've honed the skill because what I would say- is that sadness is one thing, depression is something different. So for me, I can immediately, I mean, I can be sad for months at a time. Three days of sadness because someone broke my heart or something really bad happened in my life is not anything I check in with. You know, I'm just like, okay, well, this is completely appropriate. Depression to me is different because the symptoms are completely different. Like it's like a numbing down, like everything shuts down. So that, and especially when it gets bad, it's like, I'm inoperable. So I would say like, even with the three day rule, it's like, as soon as you can determine, like, is this an appropriate reaction? Because sometimes it just is an appropriate reaction. Like your cat died. You should be sad. You may be sad for weeks. You may be sad for months. Like, this is like, I can't taste food. (laughs) It's like, Uh, okay, this is something else. Or like, my arms feel really heavy today you know it's like it's sort of a different set of symptoms and can you quickly tell us about the emotional rating system Mm. is that related it's certainly a way that helps me gauge my mood it's essentially like a numerical system that's like a very common in many industries even the food therapist was like rate your hunger one to ten my dad who's a doctor is like you always ask people to rate Rate their their pain yeah and so it was really born out of a period in my life where my mom was horribly worried about me but I was like I don't want to like a lot of times even now she'll ask me you know I'll post something on Instagram about being depressed and she gets really worried and then she wants to ask me every day tell me about how you're feeling and And even now I'm like I just don't yeah it's like I want it to just happen I don't want to give a play-by-play we sort of came up with this like one to ten how's your mood and then I sort of like evolved it over time to relate specifically to my bipolar two. So a 10 is actually too high because when you have bipolar, any type of bipolar, but bipolar two, you know, it's like, you just don't want to get too high. And then you obviously don't want to get too low. So 7.8, which is one of the necklaces we made is like my perfect number when I feel like happy, but not so happy that it's like cause for concern. And just like very stable, like it's like the perfect mood. In so when mind. your mom texts in, you might just text. She'll just back say, "What's like your number?" Seven point eight. She literally and, oh, will just be like, "What's that. your number?" So funny. My dad, who is in his late seventies and mm. living alone, I'll just check in with him, and he'll text me back and go, "ND," and that stands for not dead. Oh. <laughs> and I'm yes. like, "Oh, okay, okay, that's all we need." Well, you know what? Sometimes just simplifying. No, it's just something it's a, is just rela- so easy. helps the other person relax. Yeah, it's a way to communicate. Okay, that's great. Yeah. All right, just a few more yeah. questions. This is so great. Thank you so much. Of and course. I also love. Kay Redfield Jameson's book, mm, I'm Quiet mm-hmm. Mind, it really helped me understand my mom mm-hmm. and understand what it feels like for someone that is not bipolar. Yeah. It's hard to find sympathy for someone That's when you're like, come totally. on, just pull it together. Yeah. But another thing that I also, the more research I do, the more I realize how high achieving bipolar people mm-hmm. are and mm-hmm. artistic mm-hmm. and creative. Mm-hmm. Not always. But there's a lot of really high achieving bipolar people. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the connection between creativity and bipolar. You know, it's not something that I've done a ton of speculation on, but I guess what I would say is like, to me, one of the byproducts of dealing with mental health issues is like you sort of go into these depths that maybe if you are stable your whole life, you're not even challenged to explore. And I think within those places, like you're gaining something else too. And I think like for creatives, 
you're trying to access your soul you know, and put it out there. And I think like the comfort level you have with the depths of that is maybe you just have a familiarity. You know, I mean, I think the other thing is like for bipolar, when you're manic, like there is nothing you can't do. So like for me, when I would get into like a hypomanic state, it was like one of the main things was rush of ideas. It's like a very common thing, but like you can't contain the ideas. And at that point in my life, there was no one to be able to censor good idea versus bad idea. Now there's many people in place that are like, we'll take that one. But I think like, that's the other thing. Like you can also, when you're up, like you have a highly activated mind and the confidence, like you just have, like, you're just like, these are all epic ideas. And so I would imagine that within both of those extremes, you're gaining something again. It's like, The optimist in me says, well, cool. You do get something. (laughs) You do get something. But then I do feel the need to say, like, you don't have to be in a manic state to be creative. Of course not. Of course not. I think it's just, I mean, given how you would attribute it to that. But, like, I can be creative in my sleep. You know, sometimes I just dream about something, wake up, and I'm like, oh, that would be a cool color. That's so great. You know, so, yeah. I mean, I think there's, like, innumerable ways to be creative. Tell the uninitiated Mm. what trash dancing is. (laughs) (laughs) I know, because like when you just say that, it's like, what does that even mean? Or is it dumpster dancing? It's trash dancing, although people do. Dumpster dancing, I don't know. I don't know, just to me, didn't have the same ring to it. And also, I just was like, just said trash dancing, it stuck. But it essentially, in a nutshell, the dumpster's downstairs. So we have a parking garage under our building that some of us park in that has two giant dumpsters. Our building is also shared with a grocery store and some other businesses that generate a lot of trash. We don't generate that much trash. And I went down there one day and there was more trash than five dumpsters could have contained, much less two. It was kind of a weird day, but I just like looked at it and I (laughs) just started laughing. I was just like, just also the fact that like who we are as a brand to know <laughs> that what we're walking on. by is just <laughs> these heaps of trash just struck me as like so ironic. And then for whatever reason, I think sometimes when I feel really like happy or in a good mood, I just want to dance. Like I just like love the way that that makes me feel. And, and you're a good dancer. Too. Well, I was looking back at some footage today and I was like, I actually think I'm pretty bad. No, but not. It, it, regardless, it doesn't actually matter to me because it feels good. And it apparently brings a lot of people joy. But I was like, I said to Kelly, one of my closest friends and a longtime Bando employee, I was like, video me dancing in front of this because I just like, I got to put this on Instagram. This is just so funny. And she did. And like, people were like, oh, my God. And so then I just like started, like I found with social media, like people actually like the same thing over and over again, which is very counter to how I prefer to operate. I'm like, I already did that. It's also something you learn with a brand, like people want consistency. Consistency. And so then I just was like, this is a win-win. Like they're happy. I'm happy. And so, so it's just funny. something I do. That's how I first learned about you. Oh, really? My friend was like, you have got to oh my follow God. Jen. <laughs> That's so funny. And also, I know that you just bought a house mm-hmm. in Joshua Tree, which is such a special place. Ugh. So oh, I'm yeah. so happy for you. Yeah, it's I'm happy just, for it's me like, too. <laughs> that is a place to go to yeah. really connect with nature and unwind. Yeah. Is it with your brother or is he just helping you design it? No, he's just helping me design it. He is incredibly creative and does a lot of buying and selling vintage furniture. It just has more creativity in his like pinky than I do in my whole body. No, he's like on a whole other level. And so I just felt like it would be a really fun thing. Plus he comes cheap. (laughs) I was like, well, this will be great because I just felt like it'll be good for him to like sort of have those juices flowing and we'd spend a lot of time together anyways, but it, I don't know, it just felt like a good bonding thing. So it's been great. I mean, it's actually been very hard, nothing to do with him, more to do with like my expectations and letting yeah. go. But you're keeping like the 60s vibe, I'm right? I'm keeping a lot of it. I mean, I actually yeah. didn't think I was doing that much, but yeah. not doing that much is still is, actually is a, a lot of time <laughs> and a lot of money. So, but 
not complaining at all. Just so that's, just that's stating great, facts. You and your brother can be creative together. Yeah, it's yeah. really fun. We I have don't a get very that creative younger brother too. Oh, I, cool! That's awesome. That's so cool. Two more questions. Yeah. So, if you could write mm. your younger self, so mm. say I usually say twenty, but if you want to say mm. eighteen, a mm. dear Jen letter. Mm. So what you know now, and you're handing it to maybe you're in college, so you're 20 years old, and it's a love letter. Mm. What would it say? Mm. What advice would you give your (laughs) younger self? You you know, that's funny because I feel like everyone's doing inner child work now. (laughs) It's like a daily thing. And I'm like, I can't seem to really want to talk to her. Like my friends are all like, okay. And then today I sat with my inner child. Oh, wow. And I like sat on the bed with her and I said, what do you want today? And I'm like, "Mm, I'm not there yet. I mean, first and foremost, sunscreen, neck cream. I mean, and I know that's so like, that's so, but also just because like, I can't even imagine what's going on with my skin because the amount, I definitely went to a dermatologist and was like full on shamed for the tanning that I've done since I was probably 12. Same, Um, same. I sat with baby oil. Yeah. As I smoked cigarettes and drank Diet Coke. Yeah. And yes. then went to a tanning salon. Yeah. I mean, this was like, we were such Yeah, that's idiots, what we did. Clueless. I, I mean, some of that stuff I yeah. still do. And not... your dad's a doctor and he didn't even... Well, he yeah. tans more than yeah. anybody. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it's figure. like, we love what we love. Yeah. But, you know, anyways, all of that said, I wouldn't want to write my younger self anything that would change the course of my life. I because that. I feel like I really like it. I mean, you know, I mean, I like it. So I think that probably just some reassurance that like everything is going to be okay. Like a lot of what I've said here, you know, it's going to be real windy and it's not going to look like other people's stuff, but like, that's okay. Like it will be fine. And 18 year old me would have been like, screw you lady. (laughs) You're old. What do you know? (laughs) Because that was certainly my relationship with authority. I think reassurance is always good. But yeah, I love that you wouldn't want to change all no. your struggles because no, they no, make no. you who you are. Yeah, and yeah. Clearly, your road was not linear. You no. were not expecting to be where you're at. No. And yet you're so grateful. It's, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any happiness habits? Is there anything mm. that you do that brings you a lot of happiness oh and joy? Now, granted, we're in like, you know, yeah, a haven I of joy. Say, like, but... I think my life is a happiness habit. I think that there's probably so much that I do that I'm not even really actively being like, this is the thing, you know, I think that doing things for myself and like being really pointed and intentional about that makes me happy doing things that inspire me. Like I love going to the flea market. It's just like one of my favorite things. I usually go by myself. I just get in a zone. I feel so happy the entire time being outside. I mean, it is my life. Like, I can't imagine that there isn't a day where I'm just like actively pursuing that because I well, don't know. That's the eternal optimist. Yeah, yeah, you. yeah. I just feel the need to point out that's so interesting. You know, like here you are, you're saying that you are an eternal optimist. Your life is about <laughs> fun. And yet you still have bouts of depression. And yeah. that just shows that like, it really is something that you have to manage, yeah. right? Yet you get through it and, yeah. and you have that optimism for the next day. And yeah, totally. I mean, none of those things have to define you. Absolutely. So it's like, whether it's a mental health issue or a physical health yeah. issue, again, it's like you get to decide how much power you give those things. And it's like been really amazing to me to see how much power I could take away from the negative things in my life. And like, in many ways to just let them dissipate. And I just feel like we're the mind wants to go to a place where it's like, let's focus on that and make it as big as possible. And like, you actually don't have to do that. So I try not to without diminishing it, but just being like, yeah, I just think you have a lot of choices in life that we're not told we're given. And that's one of them. Wow. Well, I mean, you're giving a lot of people a lot of hope. And I'm so grateful to have this time to sit across from you. Of course, you got me out and... of some really boring meetings. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> and even then, you would no, still be smiling. They're not boring, but I watched. I was like, yeah, I'm usually in that meeting. Yeah. <laughs> going in here. <laughs> I'll have the mm. link to Bando mm. and your book, please, which, which is it's so exciting, and your Instagram. Yeah. And anything else? 
I think that's it. Well, to my dad's. You should oh, right. to my yes, dad's yes, Instagram. Yes, of course, to your dad's. <laughs> I'm trying to get him as many followers as possible. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Okay, when we end this, I'm going to go follow him. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This You're has welcome. been awesome. Good. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.